so glad to have Mark with us this morning. What an answer to prayer that is. And uh, I guess from this point forward, I'm on notice to get serious about this Bible study because I've got a guy that's going to be listening carefully. Um, <laughs> Uh, we are in Proverbs chapter 30. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 27 this morning, and uh, we'll try to get through to 31.1, which is a, a superscription of the sayings of Lemuel, uh, a king that will surprise, I think, some of you uh, by his background, his history, and so forth. Uh, along with this, I want you to set a tab before we begin. John chapter 5. So uh, set a tab there, John 5, and that will add and supplement our study this morning. Here is Holy Scripture, Proverbs chapter 30, beginning in verse 27. Uh, locusts have no king, so all of them go forth. Uh, that's really the word literally, go forth. Dividing into companies. 28, a wall lizard you can catch with two hands, but it lives in a king's palace. I want you to notice uh, the nature of what he has just done for us, this wise man. Uh, he has not given us a conclusion. These uh, illustrations of the creation, he has left for you and I to ponder. And so that's what you and I need to do, ponder them. Think about them. I'm going to make application, but it's just simply my application. Um, he wants you to think on your own and to meditate upon these things. Here's 29. There are three creatures that excel in their stride and four that excel in their movement. So he's back style-wise to three plus one, which is what he has been doing in the past. 30. The lion is a hero among animals and does not turn back from the face of anything. From the face of, that is literal. Uh, the idea being he doesn't turn away. He is fearless. Nothing scares him. Uh, 31, the strutting rooster and the he-goat and the king. No one dares to resist. 32, here's the exhortation. Uh, if you have played the fool in exalting yourself, and if you scheme to do so, clap your hand over your mouth. An ancient Near Eastern illustration that rings to an ancient world. Uh, 33, for the churning of cream produces blood, so the pressing out produces strife. A very, very difficult uh, text to translate. Uh, you, you read the commentaries, you read the, the real students of the language, and it's just, this, this, this is very hard. Uh, but what do we do? We, do the best we can with what we've got, and we expound the Scriptures as best we can understand them. That's my job. Uh, 31.1, here we are in the final chapter. The sayings of Lemuel, a king, an oracle that his mother taught him. Uh, I don't think I'll get to verse 2, so I won't read that. Uh, so here we are. We're in a section that we ended last time, uh, now beginning this morning uh, in chapter 30, verse 27. The two previous examples that he gave us from the creation 
uh, tiny creatures that uh, taught us wisdom. And we recognize that wisdom. Forward thinking provision on the, from the ant, the tiniest of creatures, and the security in the dwelling of the rock badger. Now here, wisdom in these two, two final examples. They come first from the locus. Simply put, they're a model for us regarding effort, organization, and unity. I wish he had picked something else. This was hard to deal with. But here are the locusts from Scripture. Uh, gigantic swarms that wreck devastation on a scale unimaginable. Locust plagues, we've heard about them. Uh, summoned in the Bible by the voice of the burning bush, the Lord Himself. Exodus chapter 10 and verse 14, So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all of Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again they covered the land until it was black. Can you imagine? That is something out of the twilight zone. It's just amazing. Jerome, uh, one of the early church fathers, wrote of his own observations of the locusts. Listen to his emphasis upon the sovereignty and providence of God. He said, locusts came and fill the lower region of the air. They flew in such an order by divine appointment, he said, by divine appointment, and kept their places exactly. Here is their weakness. According to our teacher here, they have no king. But here's their strength. Look, all of them go forward, dividing into companies. That uh, phrase literally means swarming, like soldiers marching in formation. So what is the wisdom to be observed? What could we possibly learn from these tiny creatures? Imagine the size of the mouth of a locust. Why, <laughs> it's... It's so small. It's so insignificant. And yet, when they come together and they're organized, what they can do is absolutely amazing. And I think that is the wisdom for us together. Under invisible leadership, no king, no one giving marching orders, no guidance or direction whatsoever. I want to make an application this way. You think of your own applications, but for us at Believer's Chapel, we have a meeting after the ministry of the Word. We have no leader. We all respond to the head of the church in that meeting, and that head of the church is invisible. Now, under the direction of the elders, they are the under-shepherds to that invisible leader. We take our cues. They lead, they guide, they direct, they help us. In that open meeting, we have gifted men that speak. Men that know the Scriptures, and can explain the Scriptures. We want to come away from a meeting like that 
all edified, all built up. So it's not a place for a person to exalt himself or to draw attention to his own gift. No, this is for everyone. And I admit to you, I have come away sometimes in a fog about our meeting, our open meeting, and sometimes I have come away and I have said, truly, what an amazing meeting. The amalgamation of voices coming together, teaching upon a theme and gifted men that can teach us. It's a blessing, but it is for all, not for some. The end result, all should be edified. That should be the end goal of the teaching ministry in an open meeting. All should be built up, edified, and glad, glad that they were there. Stay on the Scriptures. That's my application. Here's 28. The final, small creatures. This is a wall lizard. Look how vulnerable he is. You can catch him with human hands. But here's his strength. Notice the contrast. Last clause, he lives in a king's palace. The wall lizard runs up walls, ceilings, defying gravity. They're all over Palestine. That's where he was obviously observed. Again, small and vulnerable, can be caught with human hands. But, and so, here's the skill, here's the wisdom. He lives in the palace of a king. Okay, how, how can that be possibly wisdom for us to learn? The word palace emphasizes spaciousness, the complexity of many rooms, he is small, he is insignificant, and yet he lives in luxury. Where a king lives, the chief residence, palace. And so, believers, you and me, we are one in the same with him. How so? Well, we're vulnerable, rather insignificant in the world and the world's behavior. We call for prayer. The church calls for prayer. What's that? That's nothing. Uh, people of the world snarl. They don't listen to testimonies. They mean nothing in our modern world with our educated people. So we are thought of nothing in the world's eyes. And yet, what is our location together? We dwell in a palace with a king. How so? Well, he dwells with us and we dwell with him. Yeah, it's invisible, but it's true. It's reality. And just as easy as a lizard could crawl into the throne room of a king and listen to his edicts, so we crawl into the throne room of our king and we listen to his edicts. If we listen properly, we will learn the laws of the land. We will learn who is to be punished and who is to be exalted. We will learn what the future is. The king says, I'm going to deal with that next week. We now know. Be warned. That's the wall lizard. We dwell where the king dwells, and we have instant access to him. And that, for us, is the opportunity of a lifetime. No one else is there but the king and us. 29 begins a new section. Four stately striders here. And 
There are three creatures that excel. King James reads, go well, stately in their stride, and four that excel in their movements. More observations from God's creation. Three plus one, the style, stately striders. These balance the vulnerable, wise creatures. A separate section, 29 through 31, same style. And we've heard in the past, I think all through our lives, how important body language is. Well, did you know body language is taught in the Scriptures? Here it is. It comes from a wise man. Body language communicates. Jesus telling the teachers of the law, when you fast, shave. Wash your face. You're fasting before the Lord. You're not fasting before men. Don't come in here looking haggard. Oh, I'm a, I'm a holy man. Look at me. I'm barely, I'm shuffling along because I've fasted so long. Jesus said, you're doing that in front of men, not in front of the Lord. Body language communicates. Oh, here it is. It communicates as observed in wisdom. A march with heads held high, fearing no one but God among the creatures. We begin with the title line, four figures that excel. That word means to make good by function and by design. Here's where it's used. 1 Samuel 16, 17, King Saul, his men around him requested a, and here's our word, excellent, a skilled player of the harp who was gifted in function and by design to play an instrument for the king. That's your word. Verse 30, so we start with what we know as the king of the beast, the lion. What do we know? Stately, regal, afraid of nothing. That's who he is. And God made him with a temper. A hairline trigger that can go off instantly in which all the muscular design of the creature is aimed at its prey. Fearless. Yes, and we fear him. Dangerous, especially when he's hungry. Mighty is an intense word implying strength and emotion. That's that temper. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. We never saw Him that way. We saw Him as the Lamb. Slapped, beaten, bruised, abused, nailed to a cross, a lamb, a lamb. He was meek and mild. He never raised his voice to anyone. The only fret of anger that we ever saw from him was when he came to the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers in righteousness. What did it do to men? Men in their commerce, men in their money. It scared them to death. It terrified them. But he was the lamb when he did that. He will return as the lion. That is a scary proposition. He will come as a lion with a temper. And all of his muscular design will be toward his prey. Interesting, this word, strength, mighty, mighty with emotion. It, we quote it often, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, particularly at Christmas and at Easter. 
For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. We can hear the rumbles of the choir, can't we, from Handel's Messiah? And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. And here's your word, Mighty God. A lion with a temper set to return. Fearless, he does not turn his face to anyone or anything. That is the ravage of the mind that God gave him. He is the bold aggressor. And that is the way he is presented to us all throughout the Proverbs. 28.1, we are told, bold as a lion. That is our spiritual life. We represent a great king and we are afraid of no one when it comes to that king. 31. The second. A strutting rooster. Two terms that need clarification here. First, the strutting is a word that connects the abdomen to the legs. I wish I could give you a number of examples, but they're... they're they're everywhere in the Old Testament. Just trust me about this. And here's the rooster. Everybody loves the King James. I love the King James. The King James is accurate. The King James is a great translation. But there is no word in the Hebrew lexicon for rooster. Just want you to know. Broadly accepted taught to us basically from the ancient rabbis. And the he-goat, male goat, who strides proudly. Here's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament paraphrase by saying, the he-goat leads the herd. Finally, away from animals, we go back to the human king. The phrase, no one dares to resist. Surprisingly, that is a mysterious phrase. What I tell you is that nobody can really explain it from the inspired languages. The most trusted of all the Semitic uh, translators comes from the NIV committee. And they're paraphrasing to put in English. They come up with this translation. With an army around them. You read the commentaries. You get into the technical part of the commentaries. Everybody's got a different opinion. Here's the consensus. The word should be understood as to rise. To rise up. The idea is that the king is quelling a revolt. Which I kind of like because that's what David did in Absalom's rebellion. He came back to Jerusalem as a mighty king after the destruction of the rebellion. The King James reads, against whom there is no rising up. I think that's a decent translation, a good translation that we should all follow. That would be the stately demeanor of the king who carries himself in a way to project stability. When you become the President of the United States, your words matter. And your demeanor matters to the world. Be careful what you do and what you say because it's going to be written about, it's going to be quoted by the media, and the leaders of the world listen. So, when our president last weekend was at a commencement 
of one of our military of our one of our military institutions what did he do he fell flat on his face and what did the world do they saw weakness there he is weak shuffling along that is against the proverbs the stately direction of a king who is in control of a people what does that do to a people it discourages them we look at him and we say that's weakness that's what it does that's what it's telling us that's from the book of proverbs not from me here's 32 and 33 they're connected and so they're a separate unit the exhortation this is a full-throated exhortation to us all the treatment of others pride and plotting if you will play the fool and exalt yourself and if you scheme to do so clap your hands over your mouth here's the proverbs self exaltation the word is to rise in the manner of self-promotion in the manner of boasting any way to get yourself recognized in any form or fashion that is condemned here in this proverb scheming plotting planning manipulation that's what the world lives by that's the way the world works we don't we are answerable at all times to an invisible head and we listen to him through his word who guides us and leads us into a temperament of kindness and humility because sinners we are all weak we're nobodies we are the tiny mouths of the locusts we project no strength clap your hands over your mouth That comes from Job chapter 40 and verse 4. Here's the context. God said, you have claimed to be innocent. All the way through the dialogue of this book. Here's this great man. Here is a man who is unparalleled, in my opinion, in personal righteousness and character. And he keeps claiming that I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I have done no wrong. I have treasured God's thoughts and words in the quietness of my heart where no man can see. I don't deserve my punishment. That goes all the way through the book. His friends disavow him. You're a sinner. You are a horrible man. And then the end, God comes to him. How? As a lamb? No. In a tornado, in a whirlwind, powerful, like the lion, regal, bold. And he says, now I'm going to ask you some questions. Here's a deposition you don't want to go through. Where were you? Where were you? When I did this, when I did that, where were you? Where were you? You know what Job said at the end? 40, verse 4. I'm out of here. I'm gone. I will not offend anymore in space and time and oxygen and history. The exhortation is silence. Don't you ever, ever, ever be a plotter, a planner, a schemer, 
for anything. Don't ever exalt yourself. You want to step forward? Good for you. Here is how we do that. Be first in line to serve. Be first in line for kindness. Be first in line for gentleness and exhortation. Be first in line for kindness and prayer. Be first in those things. Do you really count others better than yourself? Why not? That's the Word of God. You say you believe it. You say you hear it. Do you? Thirty-three, four, like as the churning of cream produces butter and the twisting, pressing, wringing produces uh, blood, so the pressing out, the churning out, the wringing out produces strife. There's the end result of it all. This opening word, for, is the reason to never play the fool by living in a any form of self-exaltation whatsoever. Two figures here that represent comparisons. Churning. Churning, it is pressing. And it is used in the product of cream, pasteurization. Uh, in the ancient world, Proverbs 27, 27, we have goat's milk there translated as it produces a product. The churning matches the painful process of wringing the nose, grabbing the nose, squeezing the nose. It's Mo, Larry, and Curly, and Mo always grabbed Larry and Curly and took them into the room or wherever by the nose. That's the idea. And the product and the action was blood. Now blood, so the conclusion, pressing out, stirring up. King James, New American Standard translates it, forcing. Here it is. It's David, Psalm 56, verse 6. He calls it strife. And that's the way it's translated. His enemies, David said, are always contentious, always making trouble. That's a fool, and that's a fool's behavior. He's self-ambitious, thinking himself more highly than he should, and the Apostle Paul says, stop it. Romans chapter 12. So that's it. Proverbs 31. We are in the last chapter of the book of Proverbs, the sayings of Lemuel. Another wise man is speaking to us. By the instrumentality of the instruction, look at this, given to him by his mother. Now, I miss my dates. This should have been my Mother's Day text. But I've been slow and lethargic and didn't get it in time. The sayings of Lemuel, a king, an oracle that his mother taught him. Taught him admonitions given to the king by a very wise mother. The power of motherhood is put on full display right here, 31.1. I was listening to the radio this week. The female host of this country station was introducing a song. And before she got to the song, she started giggling and said, oh my goodness, can I hear my mother right now? I still hear her and her bony finger in my face. And then she introduces the song by Ricky Skaggs, who is a country singer, Grand Ole Opry. He is proficient with the mandolin. And the title of the song was, Don't Get Above Your Raisin. I thought, that's clever. Don't forget who you are, where you've come from. Don't forget the family that you were brought out of. And this girl said, oh, can I remember back my mother 
in these lectures, and I thought to myself, that's a very wise woman. Uh, look at this word, taught. It means to reprimand, but with passion and with love. The Apostle Paul's farewell to the Ephesian elders, Acts chapter 20. It exemplified this type of teaching, Acts 20, 31. Therefore, be alert. Remember, for three years I did not cease night and day to warn you with tears. That's how the Apostle taught, and that's how the mother in the home is to teach her children. Just like that. That's the instruction, the way it's given. Okay, so here we are, the word sayings. It is one and the same as oracle. They are both inspired, authoritative in the Word of God. Sayings is Holy Scripture. It is authority. It is put in writing. What is said is what is now written to us. Each and every word, God breathed, using the personality of the individual that actually has written to us and explained to us. What's my point? You know, we're at the final chapter, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what do I want us all to remember? What do I want to remember? From the book of Proverbs. Well, first I want you to remember that righteousness disadvantages yourself to advantage others. And wickedness advantages yourself to disadvantage others. I want you to remember that wickedness is contrary to the creation. It's, that's why it's short time. It doesn't last. And you and I, being wicked, we don't last. We're here and gone. Wisdom lasts forever. Here's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember that the fear of the Lord is your daily relationship with Him. That's Galatians 5.16. It's called walking by the Spirit. One and the same as the fear of the Lord in the Old Testament. And here is what I don't ever want you to forget. Ever want you to forget. Sayings is Holy Scripture. I've continually said, it's oral, it's in a family, it's passed down generation to generation. There were no writings, there were no Bibles, but it is accurate and inspired and authoritative. That's what I want you to remember. John chapter 5. I ask you to set a tab. One verse, John 5.46. We've seen parallels throughout the years, going through Proverbs. Look at the parallel. Look what you've learned. You see the parallel? Believe? It's mentioned twice. It's tied to Moses. It's tied to the word me. Moses and me. Are they contrasted? No. No, the Lord Jesus actually says in this one verse, if you believed Moses... You would believe me. Same word. If we understand Moses and we believe the words he said, then we believe the Lord Jesus in the same way, in the same manner, in the same context. That's his claim. What else is he saying? Bigger picture. Step back, get the big picture. You know what he's saying? You know how you get a King James, brand new, the smell, you flip the pages, and you got the red letter edition? That's important. Those are Jesus' words. Remember red letter edition? Well, guess what? He says that the Old Testament Scriptures carry the same authority, the same words that come out of my mouth, said Jesus. What does that mean? All the dreams, all the visions, all the psalms, all the proverbs, all the prophetic writings, and all the narrative written in the past tense in the Hebrew tongue 
That's all telling us the same thing. It's all inspired. It's correction for rule and righteousness that we all may be thoroughly equipped, lacking in nothing. Karl Barth may be a name you never heard of. Maybe you heard it for the first time here. He was a neoliberal, a new kind of thinking liberal. He came out of the darkness of liberalism. And he had a different perspective on things, and it caught the world's attention. And everybody started listening. He, on the continent, he became the continental world theologian of a previous generation. He was a brilliant man. His dogmatics are that thick. He called the revelation of God an event. E-V-E-N-T. Event. The revelation occurs only at the event. E-V-E-N-T. Therefore, the Scriptures, what you and I have and hold, is nothing more than a witness to the event. Let's think about that for a minute. Nudge your neighbor next to you. He's falling asleep. you got to think with me. Um, when Moses stood before the burning bush, that was an event. The flame, the voice, revelation. That was an event. Remember what God told him? You go back and you tell the elders of Israel, I am has spoken to you. When he went back and told them, that's not revelation. That's witness to a revelation. Think about that. Okay, here's another example. John's in prison. Herod's got him locked up. John is saying, well, I thought I was the herald to the king. I thought we had the king. The king is here. The kingdom's here. What am I doing in prison? He sends his disciples. Jesus says, Matthew 11, 4, Go tell John what you see and what you hear. Revelation. All these signs in Messiah. They turn, they go back to John, they repeat those words to John, and that's not revelation. That's witness to the revelation. Why do I bring this up? You know, at 2.30 on Wednesday afternoon, I thought, I've been reading this stuff for two and a half hours. What am I doing? Why am I doing this? Well, here's why I'm doing it. Because here's what you hear out in the world. You hear this from your friends, your family, your neighbors, the people that you interact with. You hear this. The Bible contains the Word of God. No, the Bible is the Word of God. It doesn't contain it. It is the Word of God. And I don't need to prove it because the Bible is revelation. It is authoritative. And it's not a witness to any event. And you hear this. Do you take the Bible literally? Here's your answer. I take the Bible based upon the genre of the literature. Some is prophetic, some is poetry, some is history, narrative, some is metaphor. I have to understand it differently. It's not one size fits all. But that's Bardianism. That's Bardianism. Here's your answer. The Bible contains the Word of God. Okay? Who makes that determination? You know, for two weeks, what I've been talking about, the autonomous man, you do. You do. It's not the Scriptures, the authority. You're the authority. Bardianism. And that, my friends, is from hell. He's a brilliant man. He had a matrix of thinking. He was unbelievable in his power. But no, no, yeah, it is not the Word of God. 
I've got a lot more of this in verse 1. We're out of time. I'm over. Next week, we'll jump back in. 31.1. Lemuel, the king, I think it'll surprise you. You're, I wasn't prepared for what I found out about him. What I want you to remember, I want you to remember that although this is oral and passed down, it has been put into writing. That's what Jesus said. He said, the things that you learned from Moses were written about me. Codified. Put in letters. Put on paper. That's your authority. The inspiration and authority of the Bible. If you don't have it, you do not have faith. Because you have nothing to believe in. And it's all up to you. And that is error. And you need to know it because the world is covered over in it. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time of study. Uh, these are deep things of wisdom, Lord, and uh, you have given us the time to learn them. Uh, may we learn them and learn them well. Uh, be with us. Strengthen us. Encourage us to be students of Your eternal Word. And I ask this in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus and for His kingdom's sake. Amen.